Hello everyone, this is Sir Rostern, and this is Ascent of Egypt. The reputation of the United Egypt is spreading to all corners of the world, and trade has vastly increased your people's wealth. With this prosperity, the Pharaoh Djoser has decided that a mere mastaba, a simple mud tomb, will not be enough to serve him in the afterlife. Instead, he has ordered the architect Imhotep to design a stepped pyramid that will be visible from miles away. Such a large project will require great resources. You have been ordered to go to the north and set up a trade post to collect the gold for the pyramid. At the same time, you must venture into the desert and find a quarry to supply stone for the construction. Your trading partners, the Minoans, Canaanites, and Libyans, could become jealous of Egypt's success and might even cease trade and attack your people. In case our diplomats fail to keep the peace, you must defend your trade ships. The Pharaoh is entrusting you with the success of this project. All right, let's read the hints. Rogan? There is a large yeah, deposit of stone to the east in the desert. Building a storage pit near the mine decreases the distance your villagers must travel to add the stone to your stockpile. The most efficient way to accumulate gold is to trade your surplus resources. You can build warships at the dock to clear the seas of raiders, waiting for the chance to intercept your trade boats and merchant ships. Build... Well, Oh, I guess trade boats and merchant ships are the same thing, but merchant ships is an upgrade. Um, build farms and produce excess food, so you can trade it for gold. You can also build fishing boats to fish for food. If you want to trade food, be sure to click the trade food for gold button, otherwise wood is traded by default. If you attack your enemies, leave their dogs intact, so you can continue to trade with them. You can build a second dog on the northeast coast to improve trade and reduce congestion. Alright, good hints. So, in prehistory, people bartered with other groups for food and useful necessities. Later, when small farming communities appeared in Egypt, trade increased in importance and people traveled far to acquire rare goods and tools that they could not find in their hometowns. Evidence of trade between Egypt, Mesopotamia, and even the Indus Valley of India has been dated to as early as 3000 before Christ. During Pharaoh Nama's reign, pottery with Nama's inscription was produced in Canaan, in the modern-day Levant, for shipment to Egypt, showing that Egyptian rulers looked overseas for rare luxury items. Despite these early contacts, Trade did not become a major source of wealth for Egyptians until the late Old Kingdom. Trade provided Egypt with cedar wood from Lebanon, ebony and ivory from Africa, incense, myrrh and oils from Arabia, gems from Afghanistan, and gold from Nubia. In return, Egypt ex exported grain, flax, papyrus, linen, gold vessels and fish. The Nile River was as instrumental to Egyptian trade as it was to the country's agriculture. The Egyptians constructed rafts and boats from papyrus reeds, as quality wood was rare in Egypt. The wooden boats that were produced were long and were lashed together with ropes. The seams between planks were packed with bundles of reed to keep the water out and they lacked the internal framing that later boats had. Egyptians used these boats to transport goods along the Nile and the Mediterranean coast. Trade and farming generated wealth for the pharaoh, around whom a cult was established, linking him to the god Horus. Massive tombs were built to prepare the house of the pharaoh for the afterlife. These tombs were filled with gifts, animals, ships, and even servants poor servants. The early tombs were called mastabas, rectangular mud tombs. So between 2667 to 2648 before Christ, Pharaoh Djoser built the first pyramid, consisting of six mastabas on top of each other. Each successive mastaba was smaller than the one below it, and giving the appearance of a stepped structure. 
an architect named Imhotep is traditionally credited with this design. The biggest pyramids ever built were those at Giza. The largest was that of Khufu, also known as Cheops, and dates from between 20, 2560 to 2540 before Christ. During the Middle Kingdom, fewer pyramids were built and they were of a smaller scale. By the New Kingdom, the tradition of pyramid building had largely ended, although the Nubians of modern-day Sudan continued to build pyramids for centuries. So it looks like we have three civilizations that are listed alongside the Egyptians, us. So let's talk about each of them. Let's start with the Canaanites. So get ready to journey back in time to a land of ancient cities, powerful trade networks and a rich and diverse culture. This is the land of the Canaanites, a civilization that flourished in the ancient Near East thousands of years ago. The Canaanites were a diverse group of peoples with their own unique language and culture, but united by a common identity and a shared history. They were great builders and architects, constructing impressive cities such as Ugarit and Sidon with towering temples and palaces that stood as a testament to their power and wealth. But the Canaanites weren't just about bricks and mortar. They were also a powerful trading nation with networks that stretched from Egypt to Mesopotamia. They traded in precious metals, spices and textiles and their merchants traveled far and wide, bringing back exotic goods and spreading their culture and influence. Their seafaring skills were also notable. They had a powerful navy and traded with peoples from all over the Mediterranean. They had a complex religious system with many gods and goddesses, but their main god was El, the god of the sky, earth and fertility. The Canaanites were conquered by several empires throughout history, but their legacy lives on. Many of the terms and concepts used in the Holy Bible, including terms such as Pharaoh and Sabbath, come from the Canaanite language, and their religious beliefs and practices have influenced the development of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. The Phoenicians, who were a subculture of the Canaanites, have had a significant impact on the ancient world and modern world through their development of the alphabet and their role in the spread of ideas and trade. So next time you hear about the Canaanites, remember the powerful and sophisticated civilization that once flourished in the ancient Near East and continue to influence us today. Now let's talk about Libyans. Picture this. You're traveling back in time to the ancient land of Libya, a land of fierce warriors, skilled horsemen and daring traders. The Libyans, as they were known, were a fierce group of people who called the scorching deserts and lush oases of North Africa their home. They were a diverse group of tribes, each with their own unique culture and language, just like the Canaanites in their respective region, but united by a fierce spirit of adventure and their love for the open road. These ancient Libyans were known for their horsemanship, raising and trading some of the finest horses in the ancient world. They were also key players in the Trans-Saharan trade routes, connecting some Saharan Africa with the Mediterranean world. They traded in gold, ivory and precious stones, but their most prized commodity was the horse. They were also fierce warriors and often fought against their neighboring peoples such as Egyptians, us, Phoenicians and Greeks. And Phoenicians are a subculture of Canaanites. And Greeks, uh, you could argue, are related to Minoans, but more about them later. They have left behind little written records, but the accounts of these ancient peoples give us a glimpse into their fierce and mysterious culture. But it's just not about war and trade. The Libyans were also known for their unique architecture and artistic achievements. They left behind impressive ruins 
of their ancient cities, and their pottery and jewelry still fascinate archaeologists and art lovers today. Now, fast forward to the present day. The ancient Libyans may not have left behind a lasting empire or major technological advancements. However, their spirit of adventure and love for the open road lives on in the modern Berber people of the North African region. And their impact on the ancient world is undeniable. So next time you hear about Libya, remember the fierce and mysterious ancient Libyans and the impact they had on the world. And last but not least, let's introduce the Minoans. Imagine yourself transported back in time to the island of Crete, where a powerful and sophisticated civilization flourished thousands of years ago. These were the Minoans, a people known for their advanced technology, beautiful art and architecture, and a peaceful and prosperous society. The Minoans were master builders, creating impressive palaces such as the famous Palace of Knossos, with its labyrinthine design and advanced plumbing systems. They were also skilled artists, leaving behind stunning frescoes, pottery and jewellery that still amaze us today with their intricate designs and vibrant colours. But the Minoans weren't just about beauty and art. They were also a powerful maritime nation, trading with peoples from all over the Mediterranean. They had a powerful navy and their ships sailed to distant lands, bringing back exotic goods and spreading their culture and influence. But alas, all good things must come to an end. And around 1450 before Christ, a massive volcanic eruption on the island of Thera, Santorini, devastated the Minoan civilization and brought in an end to their golden age. But their legacy lives on, and the Minoans have had a significant impact on the modern world. Their art, architecture and technology have influenced the ancient Greeks and the Western world. The Palace of Knossos served as a model for the labyrinth in the Greek myth of the Minotaur, which translates into Minoan Taurus or Minoan Bull. The Minoan art and frescoes have been a source of inspiration for many modern artists. Their maritime power and trade routes have been studied as a possible inspiration for the fabled ancient city of Atlantis. In short, the Minoans were a powerful and sophisticated civilization that left a lasting impact on the ancient world and continue to fascinate and inspire us today. Now, with that inspiring introduction of the new civilizations that we encounter, let's talk about the topic of this particular campaign, that is trade. Trade in the ancient world didn't have the factor of fiat currency, at least not, not for a while. At first it was just a barter system, where people would have to agree on a raw exchange of goods or services. For example, a farmer would need to talk to a fisher in order to get, to get some fish. And the trade would need to happen rather early, while the fish and the farm produce is fresh. And also they would need to share a common language or share common terms. When the civilizations didn't have the common understanding of things, they would need to uh, have translators. And a lot of people who would be involved in trading, there would be polyglots. That is, they would speak multiple languages themselves. And that's how the intercultural um, adoption of words would become a thing, is when the trades would happen, a lot of people would bring in the new terms that were not previously used in their hometowns back from the you know, long distance travels and uh, they would be seen as people who are more advanced because they have these more precise or more sophisticated terms. Uh, and a farmer would need to uh, talk to a fisherman and say, hey there fisherman, would you like to trade my uh, sweet apples? And uh, for Egyptians, they would not understand what an apple is because 
um, apples were not native to their lands and they would not grow in Egypt. So um, Egyptians would understand something like dates and melons. And dates and melons in Egyptian sounds like Wenmet and Shendit. Yeah, those are just random facts. But anyways, who doesn't like dates and melons? I mean, these words are reconstructed from hieroglyphs and are believed to be the closest approximation to the words used in ancient Egyptian. So it's important to note that the ancient Egyptian language is complex and not all words have survived the passage of time. So the translation might not be entirely accurate. Plus, we don't even know what the ancient Egyptian language sounded like because uh, there are no surviving um, I guess version of what the language sounded like. There are no surviving speakers of the ancient Egyptian language, etc. We can only decipher the meaning and the sounds from the written records and cross-reference those with the surviving um, other languages that we do know the pronunciation uh, of those languages and we can kind of take the best guesstimate. So, the trade would happen, the intercultural exchange would thrive, new ideas would be exchanged. And of course, humans being human, there would be a factor of greed that would meet with violence. And the idea was, why do you need to trade and negotiate if you can just take stuff away from other people through violence? And violence is as ancient as the human civilization. And so the wars would be fought over lands and goods and trade routes and different pastures. And right now we're entering the Canaanite territory. And of course it's a small um, garrison of Canaanites. They don't even have a um, military presence here. Fun fact. Down in the future campaigns, we'll be going through the rise of Rome, and Roman Empire played such a um, prominent role in the development of the human civilization, and particularly Western civilization, as a major power. But before they were a major power, the descendants of the Canaanites would kick their butt, because the, um, the folks like Hannibal, who uh, seized or sieged Rome rather is a Phoenician or the Carthaginian who were the Phoenicians really they were also the descendants of the Canaanites and right now we're just destroying their town center the biggest threat right now is the Minoans I don't know what they're up to I haven't seen their base yet so Let's take the fleet and explore further down the river. Oh, look at that. We have discovered a ship. What's really interesting about this new definitive edition is that they've, they've done such a great job at rendering pretty much all the elements of the game. Um, because I used to play the original game back in the 90s and of course, this was mind-blowing to me at the time because this was like the best strategy game or the best game I've ever seen. Uh, and everything looked so real and fun and animated. But compared to what is uh, what people uh, behind this definitive edition have done, it, um, the old game looks very pixelated and very outdated. Of course, it's a psychological phenomenon, but it's just uh, an interesting observation. Let's see. Let's just fight these guys off first. Dang it. Well, at least we have found uh, their whereabouts. Those Libyans. And here are the Minoans. The Minoan civilization has had a lasting impact on the ancient world. 
and many of their cultural achievements and technological advancements were borrowed and adopted by the other civilizations like Greeks. One of the main things borrowed from the Minoans was their architectural design, particularly their palaces. The palaces of the Minoans, such as the Palace of Knossos, were known for their sophisticated design and the use of light wells and indoor plumbing back in that ancient time. These architectural features were adopted by uh, Mycenaeans and Greeks. Another thing borrowed from the Minoans was their art, as well as, um, well, particularly frescoes. The Minoan frescoes are considered some of the most beautiful and well-preserved examples of ancient art. This art was borrowed in its style and techniques by the neighboring civilizations. The Minoans were also known for their seafaring and trading abilities. And the technology of shipbuilding was also transferred to the civilizations that would come into contact with the Minoans. Their writing system, Linear A, although not deciphered yet, was borrowed by the Mycenaeans, who used it as a basis for their own script, Linear B. I know, creative names, huh? In terms of culture, the Minoans are considered to have had a matriarchal society in which the women had a higher status than men, which is not known to have been borrowed by any other culture. Overall, the Minoan civilization has had a lasting impact on the ancient world and many of their cultural achievements and technological advancements were borrowed and adopted by, yes, other civilizations. All right, so what's Linear A? It is an ancient system of writing that was used by the Minoans on the island of Crete, modern Greece, in the Aegean, Aegean Sea from around 2000 to 1400 before Christ. The script is named Linear A because the characters are arranged in lines, hence Linear, and it is considered to be the first syllabic script in the Aegean region. The script has not been deciphered yet, as mentioned before, so the exact meaning and purpose of the texts written in Linear A remains unknown. Linear A is composed of around 90 different signs, so like letters, many of which are ideograms and symbols that represent objects or concepts like hieroglyphs rather than phonograms, symbols that represent sounds or words. The script was used for administrative purposes and it is believed to have been used to record commercial transactions, palace inventories and religious texts. So probably a lot of the trade, a lot of the trade uh, that we are conducting now is being recorded in linear A as we speak. <laughs> the language was discovered in the early 20th century by the archaeologist Arthur Evans and it is considered to be one of the most significant discoveries in the field of Minoan archaeology. Despite numerous attempts, the script has not been yet deciphered, and it remains one of the most intriguing puzzles of ancient writing systems. Linear A was used alongside other scripts called Linear B, which was used by the Mycenaeans, who borrowed the script and adapted it to their own language. Linear B was deciphered in the 50s, that is 1950s, and it helped scholars to understand the Mycenaean civilization, but Linear A still remains undeciphered. Here goes the last Canaanite guy in this area. He refused to decipher Linear A. Alright, so we've got plenty of stone here. Our farms are doing okay. Low unemployment rate here. Okay, so the objective here is to get um, enough stone. So these people are joining the workforce in order to mine more stone and really it's just a matter of time. We have won this campaign. 
So what do you guys think about the different civilizations? What, which civilization fascinates you the most? The Minoans, the Libyans, or the Canaanites? And of course, you can talk about Egyptians too, since we're playing this campaign from the perspective of the Egyptians. And what do you guys think of the format of the, of the Ascent of Egypt series? Do you like this commentary? Uh, would you like to see anything changed? I'd be interested to know, because I really enjoy playing this game, even though it's probably not the most popular on YouTube right now. I really like playing this game because it brings back so many great memories and nostalgia from the 90s. Let's see. Oh, our stockpile is growing. We're about to win. Hey, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode and see you next time. Please subscribe and like.